miracle that you did came up from the grave. The miracle that you did when you gave us life everlasting. Today, Father, we celebrate you. One of the most important days to celebrate in the Christian faith. The resurrection of our King. We lift you up and we praise you. And we glorify you in the matchless, the mighty, the phenomenal name of Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can you give Colin some love today? He did this all by himself and uh, it was so, so unplanned, but he I feel like I'm preaching to the cartoon Cars movie, you know? But uh, today I've got a short message, and um, but it's to the point. And I believe God really wants me to deliver this message today. And so I ask that you would just... Um, Wait for us. We've got one more song following this uh, this this homily and this service, and uh, we'll have another moment of worship before we close. Um, but today, I want to give some love not just to our, uh, our our worship leader, but can we give some to our parking attendants who helped us and ready and all them who help clean up and everything? Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. God is good. If you're watching by line, we want to say welcome to Church Alive. We do it the way that we can, amen, whenever we can, however we can, whether it's online or whether it's on a patio and preaching to you while you sit in your vehicle. But God is still here with us because the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them, in the middle of them. That's a place where he desires to make his habitation. When people come together to worship him, there he dwells, amen. And so today we're going to be talking about the resurrection. And the resurrection means so much to me, and I believe it means so much to the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, I believe the resurrection is the most important truth to the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the apostle gives us a, a declaration declaring what the resurrection is about. And he says this, he says, Let me remind you, my brothers and my sisters, of the good news that I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. He said, I passed on to you what was the most important and what had also been passed to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And amen. Hallelujah. Can you give Colin some love today? He did this first movie. Yeah. That's good. If you're watching by line, we want to say welcome to Church of our King. We lift you up and we praise you. And we glorify you in the matchless, the mighty, the phenomenal name of Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can you give Colin some love today? He did this all by himself and uh, it was so, so unplanned, but he. he I feel like I'm preaching to the cartoon Cars movie, you know? But uh, today I've got a short message, and um, but it's to the point. And I believe God really wants me to deliver this message today. And so I ask that you would just um, wait for us. We've got one more song following this, uh, this, this homily and this service. And uh, we'll have another moment of worship before we close. Um, but today I want to give some love, not just to our, uh, our our worship leader, but can we give some to our parking attendants who helped us and ready and all them who help clean up and everything. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. God is good. If you're watching by line, we want to say welcome to Church Alive. We do it the way that we can. Amen. Whenever we can, however we can, whether it's online or whether it's on a patio and preaching to you while you sit in your vehicle. But God is still here with us because the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them, in the middle of them. That's a place where he desires to make his habitation. When people come together to worship him, there he dwells. Amen? And so today we're going to be talking about the resurrection. And the resurrection means so much to me, and I believe it means so much to the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, I believe the resurrection is the most important truth to the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 the apostle gives us a, a declaration declaring what the resurrection is about. And he says this, he says, Let me remind you, my brothers and my sisters, of the good news that I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of 
course you believed something that was never true in the first place. He said, I passed on to you what was the most important and what had also been passed to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture says. You see, Jesus appeared to over 500 people and even to his beloved disciples and the apostles. And he showed up just to show them that he had risen up from the grave because the resurrection is the most important truth to the Christian faith. If Christ has not risen, you see, our faith is useless. And the Bible says he came up from the grave. It's useless. It's no good. If the resurrection is not true, God is no good, the church is no good, and the Christian life is meaningless. It's all a lie. But on the other hand, if the resurrection is true, there's some truths that we need to follow. And I've got three for you today. And the number one thing that I know from when the resurrection and from the resurrection and the truth that I apply to my heart and needs to be applied to everybody here listening to me is that our sins are forgiven. I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of reason to shout for all my sins forgiven. Amen. I got a reason to shout today because without Christ, I was lost. I was miserable. I was alone in my sin. I was unable to connect with God, who is the author and the finisher of my life. Paul the Apostle declares that he was the chief among all sinners, but because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he received the forgiveness of his sins, and his relationship with God was restored, and we too can experience this as well. Psalms 103 declares that when we come to Christ, and when we come to God, and we ask Him to forgive us, that He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. And can I tell you something? This passage makes it evident that God doesn't remember our sins anymore. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy that God doesn't remember our sins anymore? When He forgives us, He removes them. However, God's not remembering is not a forgetfulness on His part because He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He never forgets anything, but He chooses on His part to remember it no more. And even us in humanity today, we might have somebody that sins against us, but we have to choose in our heart to lay it aside and to not bring it up into a place of remembrance. To forgive someone, we must often, we must often put painful memories out of our minds. We don't actually forget the sin. It's not that we're unable to recall the offense, but we choose to put it out of our hearts and out of our minds. Forgiveness, family, prevents us from dwelling on our past troubles. And God doesn't dwell on our past. He doesn't dwell on what He forgives. In fact, Micah the prophet said that He squanders our sins under His feet and He puts them into the depths of the sea. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that phenomenal, Marcus? That's amazing. Rather than treating our sins as they deserve, God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know about you, but I've been on across the globe. I've been across the globe. I've, I've been to some third world countries, and I, I haven't found the beginning or the end of the east and the west. I haven't traveled so far east that it became west. That's so far removed. And God has removed our sins by going to the cross and coming up out of the grave. You see, when we're saved, our sins are completely forgiven. That's what the writer of Hebrews was talking about when it says that Jesus went to the cross and paid it once and for all. A one-time sacrifice to completely remove our sins. When we as Jesus, sorry, and when Jesus forgives us and we submit our hearts to Him, we're justified. We're made right before God. Romans 8, 20, Romans 8, verse 1 tells us this. He says, listen, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we can declare that when Jesus forgives us, we are not condemned, but we are secure in Him. You see, sin no longer has a say in my life. I used to have to be bound to it, and, and I was unforgiven. But now that I'm forgiven, I, I have fully been accepted by God, and I've been declared righteous in Jesus. And He doesn't remember our sins and the way that He treats us. Instead, He treats us as righteous. Aren't you glad? He treats us as one of His own, as one of His beloved. 1 Corinthians 5 says it this way, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. In this way, God forgets our sins. 
And if we fail again, 1 John 1, 9 says, He's faithful and just to forgive us over and over and over again. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't just a one-time payment or for the penalty of, of sin, which is the wages of sin is death. And now he, he laid down his life once and for all, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What am I saying? God cleanses us, and he moves on. He doesn't hold sin over us anymore. You see, the beautiful thing of knowing the complete forgiveness of God in Christ like Paul, we can say this, I press on towards the goal. I press on to the prize which God has called me to. And I leave and look and I leave behind what is in the past. I look heavenward towards Christ Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. You know the second point that comes to mind right now is not only are we forgiven, but death is not the end. So many of us are afraid of this plague and we're afraid of this pandemic and things that are coming against us. But those who are in Christ can have a, a joy and a peace about them because they know where they're going. Have you had somebody go on before you and they accepted Jesus? Today, they are in the presence of Almighty God. Today, they are walking on streets of gold. Today, they are declaring with the angels that are going before the throne room of God that He is holy, holy, holy. Holy God Almighty, they are there experiencing that which we are headed towards. That is our destiny. Come on, somebody. Because of the resurrection of Christ, death no longer has power over me. It has no power over you. We have gained eternal life. Paul shouts with a heart of defiance, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Of course, there's no reply. Why? Because death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus has conquered the grave. Satan thought he had the last laugh when he put him on the cross on Good Friday. But three days later, Jesus made a, a boulder look like a pebble when he kicked the stone out of the way and he rose up from the grave. And all the soldiers that were around trembled in fear and fell like dead men. You see, Jesus conquered the grave. And in this promise, we can too follow in his footsteps. Philippians 3 says it this way, But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ now lives. And we eagerly are waiting for Him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like His own, using the same power which He will bring everything under His control. You see, our bodies groan from sufferings and life. Our bodies groan from suffering in life. Our mind and our will and our emotions and everything that makes up our human nature besides our spirit, man, groans from the sufferings of life. But one day this mortality will be swallowed up by immortality. One day this, this, this life that is decaying will be swallowed up by life eternal. And we will be able to celebrate with the Lamb of God around the supper table. And you and I are going to talk about the day we sat in front of Quaker. But today, right now, we're going to declare that God is good. That He is holy. That He is alive. And He is resurrected. And death has no victory in Jesus' name. Sorry, i got to preach a little bit. God is good. The third thing I want you to get, and this is my last point, it's this. Number three, how we live is important. You see, because of the resurrection, I have forgiveness. And because of the resurrection, death is not the end of my life. And because of the resurrection, and because of those points, I realize that how I live now in this present life is important for the life to come. Because we know that we will live forever in God's presence. Our priorities and our devotion are focused on Him, not on the concerns of this present world. This focus does not take us out of this world, but it keeps our attention where it belongs. If Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, if He holds all things into existence in the palm of His hand, if He tells the sun when to rise and the set, and he, he tells the ocean shores where to stop when he measured the depths of the ocean floor and gives us pure oxygen to breathe in. And, and he set the sun off in a perfect 93 million miles away. If we were any closer, we burn. If we were any further, we freeze. He holds it all into existence. And if he is the one, the great creator of mankind, he needs to be the focus of all that we do and all that we believe. Because focus doesn't 
take us out of this world. It gives us purpose in it. Uh, Colossians 3 says it this way. Since then, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. For you die and your life is now hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming against those who practice such. But He says, you see, living with our hearts focused on eternity, enables us to be more effective in God's business right now. Living out His truth and building His kingdom right here and right now. Colossians goes on to say, Therefore, God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. And if any one of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You see, Christ was born kind of abnormal. He was born to die, but He was born to live again. With an abnormal mission. And we too are living in abnormal days and crazy times. But like Jesus, we are born for such a time as this. A time to make a difference. A time to live holy. A time to be the change. A time to love deeply and lead many to God. You see, these are the key points. Our sins are forgiven. And because Jesus came up from the grave, death has no victory. And because I'm now living in Him, and I've asked Him into my heart, and if you've asked Him into your life, how we live now matters. Because it's just a vapor, and it's just a moment. But we can have a promise of eternal life. You see, Christianity is meaningless without the resurrection. But I dare say to you, the resurrection is even more meaningless unless you have Christ in your heart. Paul says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. You see, you got to know him. The word there is gnosko in the Greek. It means to have an intimate knowledge. Listen, I can know you by name, but I know my spouse totally different. She means everything to me. I have an intimate knowledge of her. And when you have an knowledge of God it's not just knowing the word because some people will never come to God because they can't figure out certain things and religious practices but he says you can know him intimately how do you tear apart something that's eternal and put it back together you never can but the beautiful thing is you can know him right now and you can know him fully and he can fully know you and it's based not on religion but on relationship and the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost that's you, and that's me. And when he went to the cross, he laid down his life for his beloved. And whosoever believeth in him would not have to perish, but have everlasting life, and life more abundantly. If you've never accepted Jesus in your heart, I want you to open your mind and your heart and your everything inside of you right now to God. Because I believe this, that Jesus has a plan for your life. And he wants to know you intimately. If that's you all across this area, maybe you're listening by way of social media or maybe you're sharing this with a friend. But I want us to bow our hearts and our, our minds and our hearts before God right now. And I want us to just stand before Him. And just lay it all out there. Father, I realize that I'm not perfect. And I know, Father God, that I need Your help. I need You to save me. I need You to forgive me of my sins. And help me to walk in the power of your love and your goodness and your grace and your mercy. I pray today, Father God, that you would save my soul. If you're praying that, just say it to him. Father, save my soul. 
and help me to come into a right relationship with you so that I might be where you are, that I might walk on those streets of gold, that I might participate in your presence even though I go through the affliction now. I can walk in the peace and the joy of God. If that's you today, I want you to share that with somebody of what you decided to do. If that's you today, I want you to reach out to us. We want to pray for you and believe God for you. If you don't have a church family, we want you to connect with us. We want to help you grow in your faith. Because we serve a resurrected king. I said we serve a resurrected king. Amen? Amen. We serve a resurrected king. He's the great I am. Hallelujah. He's alive and living well. And it's a testimony because he's living up on the inside of me. And he's living up on the inside of you. Listen, we got one more song and it's called Resurrection. But today... As you're leaving, make sure you see Ray. He's going to have his yellow vest on. He's going to be waiting out there. But we're going to ask that you just drive to the right so as to save traffic, you can turn around. But that's a bad spot for traffic. So when you leave, please turn right instead of going left. And uh, and, and make sure that you, you just turn around and, and find another way to loop back around. Amen. Listen to us. Somebody says, how do we give an offering? You can give online if you want to, but we're not taking up an offering. We're not going to hold out buckets. We're here for Jesus today. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate Jesus. That's what we're here for. Amen. So let's worship God together. Let's sing this song together. Let's declare that he is resurrected. To me. 